Hey guys, Wintermute here, and today we'll be making a weapon scope in Blender 2.82. We're going to be using some hard surface techniques in order to create this, uh, and you'll be able to follow along with anything that's Blender 2.8 or higher. Make sure to like and subscribe if you like this sort of content, and follow me all the way through for a full tutorial on how to do this. Also, if you'd prefer a text version of this and many other tutorials, check out my blog in the description, wintermutedigital.com. Now let's get started. So we'll start with our default cube. I'm just going to turn on my screencast keys. And uh, the first thing we're going to do is sort of block out the shape. So we'll split it in half with a loop cut and add a mirror modifier. And we're going to change the rendering engine to EV. Now we're going to add a couple more loop cuts, and this is generally how we're going to describe the shape of this object. We'll be extruding it down a bit, and we'll have this sort of uh, truncated diamond shape. I'll try to make these particular uh, edges straight, sort of, um, and kind of mirroring the outside edges. And we're just going to make sure that our profile looks good. Now this is just a sort of random shape I picked out, just because I thought it looks cool. And there are a bunch of references I'll have in the description probably that you can look at for some more inspiration about different shapes. Now we also have to remember that this is a scope, so there's um, elements of functionality we have to design into our model. We're going to have sort of an inset upper section, and in order to do that we have to add a couple of loop cuts pretty close to the edge that we're going to inset, and then all we have to do is select it and push it in. Now we have to have those thin loop cuts in place, otherwise this is not going to work and it will deform the surrounding geometry. We'll also maybe add an upper section, and we're going to inset, but uh, remember when you're doing this and you have a mirror modifier on, you want to press B to turn off the boundary inset, so that when you do this it's not going to inset inside of the the mirror. You'll see what I mean when you do this. Okay, so we'll move in the some of the uh, inner section where I'm going to place a couple buttons later. And so I'm just going to grab this face and I'm going to move it in. Same method as before, make sure you have a couple of close loop cuts so that you have edges to deform. Uh, now I'm going to inset a bit of this part. So every time we inset, we're going to hit B if it touches our mirroring axis. Okay, I'll try to straighten this edge out a bit. And I'm going to make a pretty thin uh, slice into the mesh. So we can inset it a bit more, scale it down a little. Um, and then we can definitely extrude it in a lot more. But we'll just keep it here for now. Just, well, take a look at this mesh. Looks pretty cool. We have good geometry. It's mostly quads at this point, so we'll be able to loop cut with ease. Now, we can sort of flatten this edge a bit, but be careful of how that's going to affect the geometry it's touching. And this goes for pretty much all modeling. Make sure we have um, our geometry located in the correct position so that when we try to manipulate it, we don't affect something we don't want to. And you can always correct, uh, well, undo if something doesn't work out right. Okay, so now we're going to add a couple of knobs on the side. I'm thinking these can affect, like, the left and right um, controls. And so all we're trying to do right now is we're going to have this cylinder. Uh, we're going to select only the inside edges by selecting the, uh, selecting the rims. Uh, and then hitting Control i to invert our selection, then we can bevel it with Control b um, and then we'll have this thing to extrude out. And then we can add a bevel modifier just for some more details. Now this is one way to create a gear. I'll go over another way to make uh, another sort of gear. Um, but that's going to come later in the video. Now if this looks okay to you, then you can always keep it. Um, I'll go over an, an alternate sort of knob creating method that's a bit later in the video. So 
we're just going to try to align it to the angle of the face here, and we're just going to put it somewhere logical. Now we can always change the position around, and um, just make a couple of more surface details. And we're going to try to avoid hard, sharp 90 degree edges, so instead of just extruding inwards, we're going to inset a little bit, um, scale it down so we have a more ramped uh, edge, and then we're going to extrude that. We can also use the bevel tool to do this, uh, and we'll have this sort of knob looking thing. Now in order to add uh, vent cuts in the scope, all we need to do is we're going to take advantage of the array modifier, uh, and we're going to make one single vent just by using some bevel tools, and we're going to duplicate it. And then what we're going to use is use these as sort of a stencil to cut out um, using the boolean tool. We're going to use them as a, sen a stencil to cut a slice out of the actual mesh. So I'm going to select these edges and I'm going to apply um, a bevel to them, so Control b And you can mess around with the bevel settings at the bottom. You can hit M to change the mode to offset. And then we're going to just make a couple of these um, vent looking things. And then we're going to boolean them into our object by selecting our scope, adding a boolean modifier, um, and using the difference operator. Then we can hide our actual uh, our actual stencil and it'll be fine. Now we'll add a, a top part for a, a laser attachment. So we're just going to do a couple of basic modeling manipulations. We can bevel out this edge a bit to make it uh, less sharp. And if we change the mode properly to something like percent, we'll be able to have the correct looking bevel. Now we can move this inwards if you don't want a bevel and just have a flatter sort of profile. And we can make a couple of divots in the top. Just like that. Make sure you select the whole face that's connected. And we can also do this in the sides. You just make sure you select everything and we can all scale it inwards. And we have this cool uh, sci-fi looking scope thing. Now I'm also going to add some leg attachments to this further, so we can imagine that this is a component that might be, uh, say, pinned onto our actual scope as an optional attachment. So I'm going to cut it in half and add a mirror modifier. You'll see in the mirror modifier we have this, uh, like, a triangle with three holes at the ends. Uh, that'll just let you see what's happening in edit mode, so you'll be able to edit both sides of our mirror, which is pretty useful. So we can just extrude out these legs, and then we'll add some screw holes later. Um, we'll just give it some bevel, uh, just so our geometry looks nice. And then we can, we can inset this, subdivide it, and then well, make sure that you have uh, loop tools enabled in your add-on, so it's in user preferences. So then you can use the loop tools option, as you'll see here. So we'll subdivide first, and then we'll uh, give it a circle loop profile, and then we can just inset that, or extrude it inwards. And then we'll have these things that look kind of like screw holes. Okay, so now let's work on the, f the uh, I guess, the forward-facing... Uh, face, perhaps, of our scope. This is where we're going to uh, mount a lens, uh, as well as a couple of other uh, nice looking sci-fi effects. So we can extrude it inwards and we'll have this... Uh, I'm going to try to also bevel some of the other edges just right now. And I'm going to leave a couple, a little bit of headspace at the top of the scope and uh, extrude it inwards. This is so that uh, I can add some more lenses at the top later, uh, just because I think that would look cool. Now, I can make a section that I'll actually inset by adding some loop cuts. And we're basically going to have um, two, screw, two screw holes at the sides. And uh, we'll do that by 
using the same loop tools method as we did before by making a a, uh, a section of faces that's at least eight eight faces and then we'll use the loop tools method to uh, make that circular and then we can just inset it we'll, now we'll just extrude it inwards and there you go so now we have a nice uh, screw position all right so now for this part uh, what we're going to do right now is add a stencil sort of to cut out of the face. We're going to put a, a spherical lens in here, so we want a circular inset, and we're going to add another boolean modifier. You can use bool tools for this. I believe you may need to enable that in your add-ons, um, but you can hit Control shift b to open up bool tools. It's installed by default in Blender 2.8 and higher. And we're going to add our lens. Or, okay, so let's first add some of the top lens lenses. So we'll add an, uh, we'll, we'll make this evenly spaced by using an array modifier. Um, and you can definitely change it, change the uh, spacing, and you'll just inset it like this. And then you'll hit Control Shift B and Brush Difference. Now, Brush Difference lets you actually change the position, um, and you'll see a wireframe bounds, uh, which is pretty useful later. Now, here I'm going to show you how to make a, a flatter lens. This doesn't actually look too good, so I'll, I'll end up changing this in the model, but we'll see that later. So I'm going to select everything that we want to see, um, hit Control i to invert our selection, which is, of course, very useful, and then delete it. And then I'm also going to try to play around with the other sections, but that's not going to be too necessary. Okay, so now... Uh, let's add a little bit more detailing. We can add a, a couple of uh, screw hole punch outs like we did with the lens holder. First we can make a cross, don't worry if it's overlapping, and then a cylinder. And this is basically going to be the inverse of a, of a screw hole. Uh, now for some reason this isn't, this isn't really going to work too well. Um, probably something to do with the uh, overlapping geometry here. But I suppose this is one method you can use to cut in screw holes. Uh, you can make a cutout object and you can sort of subtract it from your actual mesh. Just make sure you align it to the geometry. Um, you place it where you want your screw holes to be. Uh, and make sure you use Alt D for this where you create an instance rather than Shift D to duplicate because instances completely mirror everything you do to any of them. So if you make it a lot of instances and then you want to change them, you don't need to change every one individually. Just change any one of them and all of them will mirror those changes that you make. And this is a pretty useful tool. Okay, so I'm going to position them here and I'm going to try to boolean them into our actual object. Um, we can scale using individual origins as opposed to their median point, so they scale. Um, they get smaller themselves, but they don't move. And see, I've cut in this um, screw structure, but it seems that that, uh, that plus the Phillips head or whatever is actually protruding from the object rather than being cut out, which again I suspect is due to the overlapping geometry. Um, so this isn't really something I need to fix, and I'm going to just end up ignoring this later. It's not too big of a deal, and we don't really need uh, we don't really need this extra geometry. Uh, and you can see that the, the fact that I have two separate objects is really messing up this boolean, so um, you may just want to delete it. You can try remeshing it or whatever uh, to make one solid object, which is pretty useful later, but uh, right now we're probably not going to do this. Instead we'll add in screw heads and we're just going to place them physically throughout the object. Now let's create a couple more uh, vents in a grid structure. So the way we're going to do this is make a couple of long cylinders. Again, we're going to use the boolean tool to cut them out, but first we're going to make an array. Now this array and boolean method, as you've seen, is pretty versatile and really useful if you want to create uh, uniformly, um, uniformly spaced cuts in your mesh. Uh, now, 
word of caution, you may end up creating a lot of extra vertices and it's really going to screw up your geometry if you do this. So you got to be careful when you try this method. But if you don't really care about this, um, and you're not too worried about the topology, then it doesn't really matter. So you can see these things extrude, um, well, spaced outwards. Just try to space them evenly. And then we can join them all together into one mesh. You may want to apply all the array modifiers because the problem is that uh, if you don't do that, what's going to happen is everything that you join together um, will take on the modifiers of the selected object, which would be the one in bright orange. So all the ones in dark orange are going to end up um, with the selected object. So I'm just going to copy the same ones with the same array modifiers, uh, and then I'm going to join everything together. Now I can apply it using the bool tool, the brush difference method, uh, and then you'll see we have this cool grid cutout, which is really useful later. Okay, now let's just add a little bit of lighting. We'll add some moderately bright area lights, and we're just going to use them to light specific parts of the object. We're also going to turn down the world shading so it doesn't actually influence our lighting too much, because it is going to look very gray if we do that. Later on, we're going to add an HDR to simulate a real environment, but that's only going to be when we port this model to cycles. Right now, we're just using Eevee because that's a lot easier to see a general idea of what this model looks like, um, but we don't really need the added detail of cycles ray tracing right now. Now, I'm going to add a couple more details to those screw in sets, but it's not super necessary. Also, I'm going to make this part a little bit less deep. Alright, so now let's take a look at another way to maybe make a knob. So we're going to select all of our... Um, we're going to select these interfaces. And oh boy, that's a messed up geometry. Okay, so we're going to select all these interfaces and we're going to bevel them, and uh, so here's a look at what happens if we try to just scale them inwards. Okay, so um, the bevel tool is usually pretty useful for making faces in places that they're not supposed to be, but the problem is we can't actually scale these inwards. I want sort of an inverse looking knob, one with really large uh, teeth. But this is going to be quite difficult to create, so this is perhaps not the correct method to do it. So instead, we're going to go with this method. So uh, you're going to want to apply a mirror modifier here, so we don't have to uh, do a, a fall off thing later. Make sure you have clipping on, and we're going to create a really high resolution bevel. Now you can look at the top profile to see this isn't uniformly circular later, but that's okay. So we're going to create a really um, high level of bevel, and then we're going to control I to select the faces that weren't originally selected, and then we can um, zoom it in a bit. And we can also add this outer bevel, but you'll note that this kind of messes up our geometry around the edges. We can use the loop tools to make a, uh, a circular inset, and there, we have a more polished looking knob. And um, so you'll note that this inset method is really useful in case we want to make some special sort of selections. So I'm going to just replace that old knob with this one. Now, a lot of the things that make these knobs interesting is um, markers to see where you're actually, where this knob is actually pointing. Another thing you want to note is that we can double tap any of the axis directions. For example, you can double tap X to move along the local as opposed to the global X axis, which is really useful if you have a rotated object and you want to move it along a face like this. So I'm going to play around with the position positioning of these lot knobs a lot, um, just because I didn't really work out the, the physical UI of the scope beforehand. And it's always good to have a sketch with you, which I do have, and I will probably show at the end of this video. So let's put these knobs on the side for now, and we'll set we'll leave that inner space for um, actual buttons. 
so we'll just scale these down a little bit, and we'll just move them up and down the face. Alright, so I'm going to give this lens uh, a black material, and you'll see how... So the problem with using EV is that it doesn't really support transparency very well, as it's it's meant to... Uh, it doesn't do any ray tracing. So... Oops, sorry about that. So there are going to be a lot of strange um, effects when you try to add transparency, and it's really not going to look very good. Additionally, the problem with a flatter lens instead of a more protuberant one is that... Um, it doesn't really scatter the light inside as well as um, as well as a normal lens. And normal lenses usually aren't flat; they're usually a lot more uh, spherical. So we're going to end up replacing this lens later. But here's just a, a look at um, some of the limitations, perhaps, of EV. Now we can try to make some highlights by artificially putting uh, like point lights close to it. And that's a good way to simulate how it would look, but um, again, Eevee really has nothing on cycles when it comes to rendering glassy objects or shapes. Um, now we can make a bit of a bevel here. Uh, I'd like to see this edge, which is a bit too sharp, be flatter. So we can uh, bevel this just with one segment, and there you go. It's a lot, it's a lot flatter looking. It's a lot better like this. Um, as we don't have any incongruously sharp edges later. Now, you can see me moving these up on the local x-axis, and yeah, so these are instance duplicates. Now we can change the, the matte cap view um, if we set this to material preview, and we can see some sort of different environments reflected in our shapes, but uh, this isn't going to be super helpful. Uh, and okay, so let's make some buttons. So we have this um, sort of beveled cube shape. Um, it's just a standard button. We're not going to have any decals inside. Rather, we're going to add some text outside to describe what these buttons do. Uh, it's a lot easier than actually having like the on and off or a plus and minus actually printed into the button. Rather, we're just going to have them as labels on the top. So we can add a bit further bevel, but since our geometry is really close packed, there's not too much we can do with it. Uh, a little bit would help, but it's really not too big of an effect, so don't be surprised if you don't see much. Okay, so we're just going to position these buttons. We can go in the front view and try to align them to the angle of the face. Um, you just got to rotate it. And we're just going to place it in this button section, which I've left out. So we're going to have uh, two s uh, buttons up there. I'm thinking these will end up controlling the power level of the of the zoom, whereas the the knobs control sort of like the right left, so you can sort of pan around in your zoom. Anyways, this isn't going to have any real functionality, so they're just kind of concepts, but you need to think of the functionality when you're modeling things. That's a really important thing um, to make sure you're keeping track of. Otherwise, if you have random things that are placed just for the sake of looking cool, uh, it can look kind of messy, and it really doesn't tell a good story when you do that. Okay, so let's add another sphere here. Um, so we're going to split it in half, and we're going to sort of uh, scale it down on one axis. Now these are going to be screws, and this is one way of making them. You want to rotate it 22 and a half degrees, uh, which is 360 over 8, I think, um, just so that we can center this cross. And then we can use the scaling options, so we can uh, make this a uniform plus sort of thing. Now we'll select this plus shape, and we're going to inset it into our actual screw object, and there we go. Now you'll notice this has really low resolution geometry, because we don't really need high resolution geometry for this. Uh, we can add a subsurf modifier, and just um, we'll just subdivide it so it's a lot smoother. Uh, and then we'll just place these in where you think it might make sense. And it's worth thinking about where it might make sense to put screws. So Think about where you might have multiple objects bolted together. For example, these vents. Maybe this is a, a separate member from our actual um, from our actual scope body, 
and all right so we have maybe these buttons are attached onto a plate which is further attached onto the scope body so it's just stuff like this that you might want to think about where you put these screws just so that we have something that sort of makes sense and you want to be careful moving it across the face make sure you use your local axis transforms uh, so you double tap the axis in order to constrain it to that axis as opposed to the global axis all right also too many screws does not look very good so make sure you keep that in mind when you're adding these you can add a couple less or a couple more it doesn't really matter too much so it's sort of up to your taste Okay, so let's add the actual uh, the viewing part of this. So we'll, we'll select a solid geometry at the back, and we're just going to extrude it outwards. Now what we can take from this is we can uh, make a sort of viewfinder at the back. So make sure you hit B so we avoid uh, adding an extra face in the middle. Uh, and then we'll just take this and we'll just make a nice looking scope for an operator to peer through. We're not going to add too much detail to this side. It's not really going to be visible in the actual render, um, though if you want, you can give it a glass texture, or sorry, a glass shader. We can also add this um, upper part. I'm thinking that we have wires sort of streaming through the, the front part of the mesh into the back part. And we can manipulate this lens, sort of. Uh, and we can make these things that look sort of like flat cables, I guess. Uh, and we'll just extrude them into the mesh. It's just a tiny little detail. You're probably not actually going to see that in the final render, but uh, details for the sake of details, I suppose. Now, you notice that I didn't actually add screws to the other side. Um, I'm not really making a game asset here, so it doesn't really matter, because we're only going to see one side of this model at once. Now, let's fix that lens. So we're going to make a much higher resolution lens and we're going to clip off half of it. And we're going to just put it in the front part. And here's a nice trick for making lenses. Uh, you want to add a solidify modifier because in the real world, lenses are not 2D. They actually have uh, volume. So you add a solidify modifier to give it some thickness. And you'll see why this matters when we actually give this a shader. All right, so now let's add a, a marker to this knob. So we can select some things and we can scale it on the, uh, on the Y axis here. We'll scale that to zero. So we have a straight line and we'll select that whole straight segment. And then we're going to start adding some materials. So we'll give a dark material to the knob, uh, one that's probably gonna be darker than the base body. And we're going to add a, a light material for the um, accent where it shows where the actual position of the knob is and see just like that we have a lot nicer detail we're going to make these buttons I was trying to make them silicone sort of but uh, adding subsurface just really doesn't work too well too well and it's too much complication so we don't need that we're going to add also another glossy metal to our screws and we're going to make them darker possibly a bit less reflective and our body is just going to be um, a sort of darkish metal. So we can turn down the roughness and turn up the reflection, uh, or sorry, the metallic nature of the material. And we'll give this back part a glass text, uh, a glass shader, sorry, for the hell of it. Now you're, you're really not going to be able to see much. So this is what happens when you use EV. We're going to switch the cycle soon, so you'll actually be able to see some more details, but you'll see that there's some weird uh, artifacts when you do this. All right, so now let's add some labels. Now you can do this by texturing, but um, I'd rather do this through pure geometry. This is just because it's simpler and I don't want to assume any of you know how to use um, texturing applications so we can do this all in blender which is really cool that um, we have the functionality so uh, as i said this would be the power knob and we're just going to move it close to the structure um, we'll give it a white color and then we're going to use the shrink wrap modifier later just to make it stick 
perfectly onto our face. So we'll just apply it and we'll add a bit of offset so it's not actually intersecting with the geometry. And there we go. Uh, thermal, clear, I don't know, whatever you want. So I'm thinking this just enables uh, thermal vision. I don't know if anything like this actually exists, probably doesn't, but that's alright. Okay, so I'm going to move these knobs up top. I wasn't actually thinking about how this would operate, but uh, now that I think of it, it might be a bit hard for someone to reach that second knob um, if they're if they're directly stacked next to each other. Uh, so, you know, usability is something you should probably consider when you're making these meshes. Now, we can actually change the fonts to something. I like hack. Um, you can also use something like lane, and you can get all these fonts off of uh, a website like Google Fonts or Font 1000 or something. Just search up uh, free fonts and just uh, download them and import them into Blender. Now, I'm going to have these buttons sort of the same height as the font because I think that looks a lot better. And, okay, so you'll see that these knobs are kind of useless without knowing what they represent. So what we're going to do is add a couple of markers. And this is going to be pretty fun. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a curve and a couple of circles. And, okay, so we're going to array these circles, um, and then we're going to try to shape it onto the curve. But I don't really know how this geometry is mapped, so I'm going to have to do a lot of fiddling with the axes. Just try this until it actually works. Try to line up the, the faces, and then uh, you'll get something like this. So I'm just going to arbitrarily choose 16 of these uh, circle dot things, and I'm just going to change the spacing so that they're pretty evenly spaced. And then we can apply these modifiers so we don't need that curve anymore. And then we're going to use the same shrink wrap, shrink wrap method we used on the text. So we're just going to place them around our knobs. And then we're going to apply a shrink wrap modifier. Uh, we can use the eyedropper to pick the, uh, the actual scope to shrink wrap it too. And then we can just duplicate it over. And there we go. Now, those are a bit large, so we can scale them down. If you have individual origins scaling set, then you'll be able to do this. If it's median point, it might just shrink it. So make sure you just change that at the uh, bottom center of your screen. And there we go, we have some cool markings. Okay, so you'll also want to make sure you have import images as planes uh, available in your, um, in your settings. Uh, user preferences, go to add-ons. And then we're going to add one of these warning symbols. So you can just go to that uh, import images that you saw me click on, and we'll just shrink wrap it. You don't need to change any of the default settings. We're just going to have a standard diffuse looking sticker. And there you go. You can find these sort of uh, stickers online if you go to, say, textures.com, and I'll include a link in the description. Now for the lens. So this is one of the coolest parts, I think. So we're going to totally turn down the roughness. Um, and we're going to have this inner lens, so we're just going to want to have two of these, um, two of these half spheres, and we're going to sort of align them, and they're going to have the same glass texture, and you'll see that really cool uh, lens effect. So just remember you want to add solidify when you're working with lenses. So we're just going to try to put that warning label uh, in a good position. And we maybe want to darken the color of these lenses. Now you can tint them however you want. I think red might look good, but uh, I'm just going to go with a darkish black for now. And you'll note we've changed the cycles by this point. Uh, sorry if I didn't mention that before. Uh, but that's the only way you'll be able to render real glass. Now for the environment texture, um, you're going to have to find your own HDR. something From something like HDR, um, HDRI Haven. Uh, I'll also link that in the description. And then we can simulate some real environmental lighting effects. We also want to turn on transparent film so we don't actually see it, although we can add a backdrop later on. So you'll see that our buttons now sort of reflect the environment. They have a little bit of roughness, but the metallic property is mostly turned up almost completely. And yeah, we have a pretty cool looking scope right now. Uh, so. Let's add a laser. Pretty easy way to do this. Add a path curve. And then in the geometry settings, 
we can make it thick. So we'll add some extrude and some depth. Now you can you can sort of look at this if you want. It's going to be really thin and it's probably not going to make too much of a difference, but I'd like a, a more circular profile. Then we can just give it a, a straight up emission and we're going to set this to a really absurdly high number like 20, just because it's a laser, you know? Now we can also add some other more advanced effects to, to this laser, but I'm not going to cover that right now, maybe for a future video. We can add, we can turn up the contrast a bit uh, by using the color management, and this is really cool. There's a lot of applications to this that I'm not going to cover in this video, but you can get a lot of cool filter effects. Okay, so now let's add some more detail to our shading. So I'm going to do this with an image texture, um, and I'm basically going to try to add some roughness or some sort of imperfections because our model looks a bit too perfect right now it's completely uh, blemishless metal and that doesn't look really realistic so we'll add this image texture and i'll add a link for the sources for the uh for this noise um, it's from a pack called contamination that you can find and we're basically just going to add it to affect the sort of metallic, uh, the shininess of our material, as well as give it some more color. So we don't want it to be too metallic, we want to add a little bit of roughness at least. And we can also fine tune the amount of effect this has. So we can set a constant interpolation by using a color ramp, uh, and we can sort of change the amount of this effect we have. In order to scale it, we can add a mapping node as well as a texture coordinate. Just plug in the generated, we don't need to UV unwrap this. Um, and we can modify the scaling as we see fit. We can also change the rotation and position, which you might want to do. And just be careful you don't add too much of this. Now Cycles does have a, a pointiness node, which you can use to find the sharp edges, but that's for some reason not working so well, so I'm not going to show it here. Uh, though you can find your own tutorials online, which definitely show you how to add um, edge wear. Alright, so now we have our model. It's got a little bit of imperfection. Now we can do the same thing to the buttons too, um, if we want to. We can add a texture coordinate as we did before, um, a mapping node. Um, and we can add a bit of random noise using the procedural noise, uh, for example, the Musgrave. Or we can add an image texture, for example, fingerprints. Again, we can use this constant slider effect in order to fine tune how much of this effect we actually see. Um, it may not render too well in this for some reason, so I will end up just replacing this with um, Oh, okay, so this color ramp is in the wrong position. We're not actually trying to change the vector coordinates. We're going to change the color. Okay, and there we go. That's what it's supposed to look like. But I think this is a bit too round for my taste and kind of spotty. So um, we can try to manipulate the X, Y, Z using a separate and combine. So all this does is expose the X, Y, and Z coordinates. Um, and then we can manipulate each of them individually using a math node. So for example, we can multiply the X, Y, or Z effect um, and only manipulate that specific axis but this just looks kind of like random spots so um, instead of this we can try using an image texture this is going to be from the same contamination effect um, which I will reference in the description so I'm gonna add something that's sort of like fingerprints and You'll see that I can tune the effect using this color ramp. I can use the ease instead of constant in order to have a more realistic looking fall off. And there we go, we have a couple of smudges now. Alright, so I'm going to add a backdrop. The reason I'm doing this is because Blender can't really uh, render uh, transparent glow properly. Uh, and you'll see what that means later on, because we're almost at the end and we're going to get into the compositing of this. We'll try to make this completely dark by turning up the metallic and turning down the albedo to just pure black. Now, um, 
So our model looks pretty good right now, but there are still a couple of compositing changes you might want to make here. Um, we have this nice decal and a couple of labels, but you'll notice that I haven't actually labeled the buttons. So um, they don't have any like, uh, there's no sign saying which one is like increasing power, or which one's decreasing power, uh, which might be a mistake. So we can add that in later. So let's go into compositing and we'll take a look at our render results. And we're going to add a couple of uh, basic compositing effects. Primarily, we're going to add glow. So make sure you select use nodes once we actually start the compositing. Or rather, okay, so first of all, let's uh, bevel out the structure. There's too many sharp edges, and the bevel, since we have so much like hard, sharp geometry here, it's not going to work too well because all of our loop cuts are way too close together. Um, so we're going to just bevel this manually. We'll select the edges we want to bevel. Um, I mean, you can try to experiment with the bevel modifier. I'm not really sure why it's not working here. It doesn't really matter too much, um, as we can just do this manually. So that's what it should do. For some reason, it's not working on our actual mesh, but oh well. So now we can just select these faces, and we can just, uh, sorry, these edges, and bevel them manually. It's a little, it's a, it's a small effect, but I think it really adds a lot to our final composition. So make sure you do this. All right, so now to the compositing before I jump back to fixing the model in a moment. So we're going to add a glare node, and you can see how much this is lagging my computer. Uh, we just have a normal fog glow, and since our light is so bright, it's actually going. we're actually going to have to uh, turn down the mix effect, which is basically how much uh, we're mixing our actual, com our actual render image um, with our composite effect over top. Also, I noticed that I clipped off the bottom corner of one of the, of the scopes, so we're going to just uh, move the camera so that we can see all of it. Alright. So that looks pretty good. Um, and you'll just wait a second and you'll see the glow effect take place. Right, so that's a bit too bright as it kind of takes away the color of the whole image. So we're going to turn down the mix factor by a considerable amount just to lessen that. Nothing else in our model is actually glowing too much, so it doesn't really matter. Now we can add a color balance. So uh, for this, the lift kind of modifies the colors of the shadows, gamma modifies the midtones, and gain modifies the brighter colors. So let's not change this too much so it doesn't look like you applied some random Instagram filter to it. Um, We'll keep everything fairly close to the center, although I want to increase the gain and turn it a bit redder, just so we can accent that laser. And we can also turn up the contrast just a little bit. Alright, so we can give it a bit of a gunmetal blue tint. And yeah, that looks pretty cool. Um, now, here we go. I forgot to add the plus minus signs, so let's just do that right now. So now we know that the further plus or the further button from the scope is the increased power, and we're also going to have this IO button. So this is just going to be on and off for our thermal vision. I'm not really sure how to say this except for IO. I think that's the standard. But yeah. So now we have our on and off button and all of it's properly labeled. Um, now you'll notice that that minus sign is maybe a little bit too small. So we can just scale it up ourselves. You can remember you can hit the period button in order to, um, only if you have a numpad by the way, you hit period in order to zoom in on the specific object you're looking or you have selected, which is really useful. And make sure to have everything centered so it doesn't look weird. All right, now all that's left to do is increase our number of samples and we have our final render. All right. So 
I think this is a pretty cool effect you can do, um, and there's not too many hard surface techniques that you need to use here. They're all generally pretty simple. Remember, we use the array and boolean modifier combined in order to make these evenly spaced vents and effects. Um, we make a lot of use of the inset um, and extrude tools in order to create these sharp edges. And we remember that if we have to um, sort of push in geometry, for example, the vents on top of the knobs, that we need to have close set um, loop cuts. So we're going to take some loop cuts and we're just going to uh, like move them closer to the uh, to the edge that we want to slide inwards. And this may take a while to render, but that's all right. Um, I think that's pretty much it for the recap. Also, remember we can use, um, instead of adding textures, we can always add the shrink wrap modifier to some text in order to create labels, which simplifies the workflow a bit because we can do everything in Blender. And we can remember to add solidify to your lenses because lenses in the real world are three-dimensional. They are not two-dimensional plates. Okay, and there's our final render. That looks pretty cool. Not too bad for 45 minutes. Now this is the first sort of really long form tutorial I've done, so if you have any interesting feedback, um, please let me know in the comments. Um, and if you want to look at the sketch I started off with, or some of the inspiration I use, I'll have that linked in the description. So thanks for watching, and I hope this helped you. If it did, make sure to like and subscribe and all that, and I'll see you next time. Bye!